Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about Refutil. I should probably start a little bit about uh, myself. And it's usually something I need to do. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Sawyer X, and this is a funny picture of me. I work at Booking.com, where I get to write Perl for both fun and profit. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. And I maintain the Dancer 2 web framework. Uh, I'm the project lead. It's actually a group effort. But I have to kind of make some of the decisions and uh, some of the development. And I'm happy that nowadays I don't release it. Now JSON Chrome does, so it's even better. And um, I'm the current pumpkin. Uh, I, I'm terrible at this. I really don't like doing it. I had to do it like a million times. Uh, you have to list stuff. I, I'm bad at that too. I like daffodils, so yeah. yeah. Um, if you're interested in working at Booking.com, if you're looking for a job, uh, you can come and talk to me. We do a lot of uh, crazy stuff. Some of the stuff that we do is trying to make Pro faster, which is very, very interesting. It's a very hard challenge. And we're kind of using like six terabyte of data right now. So if you're interested in scale, we have some of it. And this is Refutil take two. And the reason it's, um, it's take two is because I, I did this talk for a few conferences. And then a core developer in Pro 5 called Zephram looked at the talk and said, oh, it's really nice, except that one's wrong. And that's not the best way to do this. And this accidentally works. So I don't know. And you're kind of licking memory here. So <laughs> that some of it had to be completely rewritten. And after I looked at the talk, I felt like I wasn't explaining it well. So I decided to redo the talk. It's almost uh, from scratch. And I did graphs. So I'm hoping it will be better. So if you've seen the talk before, then this will probably still be new, because uh, the core portion of it is actually different. And if you haven't seen it before, I'm sorry, ahead of time. But you know, no money back. Um, so Refutil started with this email that Yarko Hitanimi sent. According to Wikipedia, he's in charge of about a core, quarter of the Perl 5 core language. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. And he said, There's, I found a really interesting idea. It's just a random, very, very small micro optimization that if you do ref foo equals array, which a lot of us do for a lot of cases, what it does is compile it into a, uh, an string eq check against a constant string array or uh, hash or whatever it is that you use and that's kind of silly because what ref does is actually get that string and then you're doing a comparison so it's kind of weird and we could probably optimize this before i go into how i did this and what i did and how it works i want to talk a little bit about ref as a function if we have a piece of code my foo equals array ref and write this say <coughs> check if ref foo equals array. Is this going to print yes or no? Very good. I'm, I don't have trick questions here. Then if we try this, is it going to print yes or no? No, because there's a small typo there, which happens. Brian D. Foy has an entire article where he says that because of stuff like this and because regex is actually blessed into a package called regex, it's not full uppercase, so people forget that, and is there a P or not. He actually maintains the list of, of references, and then he checks against them. So like this is major enough to point out this mistake happens. Uh, what about now? Uh, I changed this to a hash ref, so no. Well, what if I do this? Oh, well, now it, it, it is true. And if you notice, the, the bless here basically associates it with a package called array that is not defined anywhere. So if you try some runtime stuff on it, it will fail, but it's allowed. And I think the problem is that ref is used to do two different things. And it will do one or the other, depending. The first one is that we, we want to check what kind of container we are referencing. So if this is an array, or if this is a hash, we want to check that. But the other thing that ref does is tell you whether a reference that you're holding is associated with a package, meaning it's blessed. It's, a, it's an object of it. And it will do one or the other depending on whether it's blessed or not. So if it's blessed, it will do the latter. If it's not blessed, it will do the former. And you actually have to check that, and no one does. 
So there is a solution to it. All you have to do is use scalar util. It has a function called ref type, which gives you the type of the reference, regardless, or for some Americans, irregardless, I guess. Um, it will tell you whether uh, the type is a certain reference or not, re uh, whether it's blessed or not, doesn't matter. So we call ref type on foo. Even after we blessed it, it will say, hey, this is an array, because it looks at that only. But there's a problem with this. Um, let's say that we have a string instead. And what we do is call ref. If we call ref, not ref type yet, this will work just fine. But if we change this to ref type, we get a warning. The warning is uninitialized. The reason is that due to a design decision early on, ref type doesn't return empty. It returns undef, which means that when you call ref type on something, you return undef, and then you're trying to compare undef to something. So Perl says, hey, are you sure you're doing this right? Because you have something here that's undefined. It's not like you can't really compare undefined. You know what? I'll make it empty, but maybe you want to revise this, which is what runtime warnings are for. So doing it right, let's assume that we got it from somewhere, and we don't know whether it's a string or it's a reference. All we need to do is call ref first, because ref will return true or false um, based on whether it's a reference at all. So if it's not a reference, we won't run the ref type. If it is a reference, we'll run the ref type, and it's fine. We can also put it in a function, is array ref, and this is how we would implement it. We would just have scalar util and call the same thing. Or there's an alternative that is a tiny, tiny bit faster, which is to disable warnings for uninitialized in that scope and then running it. It's just a fraction uh, faster, and it's very hard to notice. But it will work just fine, too. Basically telling Perl, I know I'm going to do this. Don't worry. So what kind of fun functions could we introduce if we wanted to? Is array ref is just one. I use it throughout, but it's just one of them. What other kind of references do we have? Yell out. Code references. Cool. Uh, before array reference, there's something that comes right before that. So it's scalar ref, right? After uh, uh, hash ref, right? Scalar ref. Code ref. What else? Format. Ah, regex ref, glob format. There's one more. IO. IO, nice. There's one more. Ref. Very good. Nice. Ref, ref. I like that. So we were going to have to write all of these functions, of course. So I wrote refutil, and I looked at it from the perspective of not the pure Perl side, and not trying to make it more correct, but trying to write it in an optimized way. So I started with excess, and I really, really, really like excess. Um, Perl 6 avoids it using FFI uh, in a very native way. Perl 5 has several FFI libraries, so you could still do that sort of stuff. But excess gives you a way to interact at a lower level, to really touch the C level stuff, and it's really cool. It's basically a bunch of glue, which is implemented as functions and macros, and you just have to learn these and see what other people do. They're not the best documented, and we're working on it, but um, it, it's really, really cool. And it gives you a lot of power. I was looking for slides that have this sort of thing in them. Uh, I like this one. I like this one more. I like this one the best. And excess is very powerful. And people think about powerful as in, like, it's really fast or it's really strong. But sometimes that strength is, is basically simplicity. The, the, the ability to express a complicated thing in a simple way is strength. It is power. And that's some of the power that Perl has. It's able to express very complicated ideas in, in a really succinct way. And Access does this to some extent as well. So Access has data types. For example, an SV, which is short for scalar value. Any dollar thing is an SV. So, you know, data types, types. But in a way, there's one called PVAV, which represents an array. If something is this SVT is short for SV type. So if something matches a type of an array, we know this is an array variable. We can call SV type, which is a macro that checks what this is. We give it some kind of SV, and it will tell us what the type is, and then we compare it, and we see very easily if this is an array. Now, if this is a reference, we're going to have to dereference it. So we can call SV, uh, SVRV, which basically says, give me the SV that this references, and then the reference that we have. We come into the same problem of you cannot dereference something unless you know it's, an, it's a reference. So we can add a piece of code that says, is this OK to treat this as an 
RV as a, as a reference? Can I use this as a reference? And it will actually check a single flag on the SV to say, yes, it's a reference. And if it is, I would like you to get the type of it after the referencing it and check it whether it's an array. And this is an entire um, excess implementation of the pure Perl code. It checks if it's a reference. If it is a reference, it dereferences it, checks the type, and compares it to a known type. That's it. We've just written the entire code. Well, it's not a complete function yet because we can't call this yet. So we're going to have to wrap it. First, what we do is run this check and then call either excess return yes or excess return no, which will provide a value back to the user of a yes or no. And either one will give true or false. Well, one will give true and one will give false. We also have to give it a name. So we're going to say, hey, this returns an SV. So it returns some kind of scalar for yes or no. We're going to call it as array ref. We're going to send in an SV, which will be the reference, the foo that we're sending it, which will actually add a bunch of checks for us to make sure that someone has sent something in. If someone sent less than this, access will say, hey, some, I'm sorry, someone defined a function here that's supposed to get one argument. You didn't send one argument. You sent zero or, or more than one. And PP code is basically a way to tell access, I'm going to write code here that I don't want you to play with the stack for me. The excess and the pro pure Perl layers, they talk using stacks. Well, a stack with pointers to that stack. So when Perl wants to send something to the C level, to the excess level, it actually provides it with a stack or a portion of it. And excess can actually take stuff from that stack to get his arguments, and it can return stuff on that stack to return arguments to the user. And PP code says, I know what I'm doing. Let me reach a lower level where you don't do that stuff for me. Now, there's one more thing. Um, how many people here know what tied variables are? Familiar with it? Tied variables, you have to think about that. They need um, extra work in order to support them. And it's, it's quite a lot. I'm going to uh, show this. Try to keep up. That's it. So. <laughs> So by calling SV get magic, we're basically saying, if there is some magic here that applies to tight variables, please just make sure it runs. And uh, I want to support it as well. That's, that's it. This is an entire excess function, which does the exact same thing, but on a lower level. And it works with the structs that Perl uses to represent all of these scalar values and these array uh, vari variables and all of that stuff, which is really, really cool. But we can go a level deeper. So, Let's think of how we can do this more powerful. I, I actually wrote this, and then I timed it out, and it wasn't that fast. So I was like, oh, this is kind of, this sucks. And um, Yarko pointed out that Perl actually optimizes a lot. And the ref and the EQ, they're really fast. They're not that slow. It's silly, but they're not that slow. So the excess didn't really add a lot, of, um, a lot to it. But I was wondering if I could make it faster. And someone said, hey, um, how about you write it as, a, as an op? So what are ops? Perl, despite what a lot of people think, Perl actually has a compilation phase where it reads the code, compiles it into a tree of operations that it will take. So um, an operation could be an addition. Like if you take a look at two plus three, these are three operations. You have two numbers. You have a, a, um, an operation between them of an addition. So Perl does the same thing. For every code that you write, it actually tries to compile stuff. And it recompiles. Like compiles parts of it later, and it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. But you have the ability to write your own ops that will do whatever you want, which is nuts and awesome. And we're slowly scratching what we could do with these. They're very powerful. And if I could implement it as a custom op, I could make it a single operation, which will be fewer, and fewer means faster. So this is a line of code using be concise uh, through dash mo, which activates b. And it says, if I had a string that said is array ref and a foo argument, what do you see it as? What kind of operations? And these are all of the operations that Perl sees in this line of code. I'm going to trim this down. It's a lot of lines. There are three lines here that have a minus at the beginning. These are lines that Perl actually optimizes away. It says, I, I don't need to do them. I, I know they exist there, but I can avoid them somehow. So let's remove these lines. Additionally, we have an enter and next state which correlate to the dash E 
in order to call the first thing on it, like it creates a, 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 a scope and all that stuff. So we don't really need that because we want to focus just on is array ref. And we have a leave here, which is the end of the program, so we don't want to see that either. Let's clear out the rest of these. Let's clean it up. This is the four operations that will happen when we have a, a function called is array ref or your hash ref and a variable inside them. Now, these markers at the beginning, one, zero, and, and pounds, explain which, are, which kind of ops they are. There's a different way to run mconcise, which is with terse, and it tells you what those are. The first one, which I won, is unary op, which means that it's an op that takes one argument. And that argument is going to be the push mark. The second two arguments are pad ops, which means they go to the pad. If you don't know what it is, it doesn't really matter. So what we have is this tree. And I've taken a lot of effort in drawing this. <laughs> and I hope it's helpful, because I didn't have it originally. And I think this makes it a bit easier to see what we're going to do. See, what we want to do is replace all these four operations with a single one. And that's going to be much faster, hopefully. But the problem is that we can't just remove them and replace them. What we need is this foo over here, because we need to know what we operate on, right? We need foo. So this is tricky. What we are going to have to do is reach into that tree after it's created by Perl. So it will have to compile this. And then we will have to walk that tree, reach foo, and then say, please run a different operation that we created on foo. This is going to be a bit tricky, but we are going to write this. So let's take a look at this code first. This is the access code. And what we want to do is have that function there, but then we want to replace that function with something faster after it's compiled. Now, in order to replace it, we're going to have to write the function in a different way. We can't just write it this way because we want to hook up to it. So in order to do that, we're going to go one level deeper. The PP code thing and this entire definition, it's going to run through an excess parser that will generate a bunch of C code instead, which is much more lower level. So we're going to write that code ourselves. First, we create a function. The name THX access func is just a, a name for the function. And it receives a code reference to itself. First, we declare the access arguments so we can use them. Then we do the check ourselves, because now it's a function that receives everything, and we have to do the check ourselves. When we call dxsargs, declare excess arguments, we have a variable now called items. And we can check items for the number of arguments that we got. Then what we do is pop from the stack. So Perl is actually sending to the excess and to the C layer variables using a stack. And when we pop, we basically say, give us the first thing on it, which will be the first argument. So just pop the stack. Give us the thing there. We know it's a reference. And we've already checked that there's at least there's, there's exactly one. Now we're calling the set magic. We're calling this code again. But the problem is that the excess return did two operations that we can't have here. The excess return, first of all, decided on true or false based on excess return yes and excess return no. We're going to have to use the proper true or false values ourselves. And the second one is the excess return actually made it the return value. So we're going to have to provide the return value ourselves. Super complicated. We're going to use uh, PLSVS and PLSVNO, which are the global variables in Perl for yes or no, true or false. And then we're going to have to provide it back. So we're going to do that with push on the stack. So we pop one to get, and we push one to return. That's it. And we've just converted it to a different lower level C level function. And it works just fine. But because we wrote it this way, we cannot hook up to it. After it's compiled, we can play with it and change the ops. So in order to declare this with a name, we just created the function, but we still need to give it a name and you know, a namespace and all that. We call new excess proto portable. And new excess proto portable allows us to declare a function. We basically say, this is the name of it right here. Refutil is array ref, the full name. And then we give the function that actually implements it, which we already wrote. So please create this function. File is where we defined it. And the prototype, just dollar, so only one. And it will return the CV. And the reason that we define it this way is to get the CV back, because that's how we hook up to it. All right. So now we're going to have to write ops. We're going to have to re-implement it as an op, which will be the one that we want to replace it with. 
So the first thing is to define an XOP, which is just a description of it. Fairly simple. There's an uh, XOP variable, and then we call XOP entry set, which adds values to it. The first one is to that the name is array ref, and the description array ref check. Not very good with um, descriptions, but this will be very useful for debugging because Perl could say, oh, I know this op. I have a description for it. And now we're going to also have to register a new op. We're going to do that with the incredible complicated Perl custom op register, which basically says, please register an op by this name with a description by this name. That's it. So now Perl knows that there's an op that it could use. And we haven't written the code for the op yet, but we already have a description for it. And we now declared it. So we should be writing this op. This op should be a similar implementation. If we took a look at this function, it's not ready as an op. It's just a C function. We need to re-implement it as an op. And ops are a bit different. So what we're going to do is transform this into an actual op. And the reason that we can transform is because they're very similar. So first, the signature at the top there is static op now. The name, let's give it a different name. PT checks is actually related to the current context of Perl relating to threads. Just put it in. You don't worry about it. Now, we're not going to declare the XS args, but we are going to declare the stack pointer. And it's a similar mechanism to allow us to access the variables that we get, the parameters. We don't need this check because we're going to define this op as an op that receives one thing anyway, and we're going to assemble it into the tree. So we got full control of that. We don't have to check it in the code. These entire lines stay exactly the same. We take something off the stack, we run some check, and then we return a result on the stack. Exactly the same. But we have to do one thing. We have to synchronize the pointer that we have to the stack with the new one, which is the corollary to the declare stack pointer. And that's this small line here, put back. In an op, you declare the stack pointers in order to access stuff and you put back in order to synchronize it. Of course, there's one remaining thing. We have to tell Perl that this op succeeded. Return normal. That's it. Basically saying, hey, we did it. It's good. OK, so wow. We have an XS function, and it will be compiled. We have an op that implements something similar. The first thing that uh, People have asked me is, why do we declare it twice? Why do we write the same functions twice? Once is an op and once is an excess subroutine. And the reason is simple. Originally, I had written the x sub to just croak because I wanted to know when someone accidentally reached the excess sub because I didn't replace them properly. I wanted to know if I was able to replace them. So what I did is made the original croak. If I'm able to replace them, it won't die. The problem is that Pro is quite dynamic and I'm stating this in a very uh, light way. And you can actually get around the compilation part. So you can call it in runtime to get around that and still reach the excess code. So we're going to implement the excess code as well. This is in C, so we're, it, I actually use macros inside it, so there is no copy-paste anywhere. But it allows you to call this function in two different ways. One as a runtime, and then you get around the compilation phase, you reach the excess function, it's still fast. The other one is to have Perl change the op codes, and then it's called as an op. So, OK, we have the functions. So we have the tree. We have the op code. We still need the part that replaces them. So the way that we do this is right. we need this entry point to utilize this in order to replace the entire thing. What we're going to do is introduce something called a call checker, OK? And the call checker wraps a subroutine and is called before that subroutine is called. And it even receives that subroutine, that, that op. So you can play with that. And the return value of the call checker is what you want to run. So we're able to actually go into the call checker, reach the entire tree, we can get foo, and then we can return a new tree that has our custom op, right? It's pretty cool. So we're going to hook up to this part, and this is where we're going to rewrite everything and provide a new tree back. So far, so good. Does anyone have any questions before I continue? OK. I'll take that as, no, we fully understood, and we're shocked completely, and I 
OK. So um, yeah, this is the new tree that we want to create there with the arg, of course. So we call CV set call checker. And this is why we needed the CV, because the way that we create the call checker is using a CV to a function. So we recreated this as a C function that we have a CV to, and then we can call it. So first, we provide the CV, the CV of this part. Remember, we created a function and got a CV back. So this is the CV that we provide for it, basically saying, please create a call checker for this function. And then we give the name of the call checker, where we're going to do the rewriting code. And this is the third argument. It's so a CV cast as an SV, just docs. All right, so let's take a look at how we're rewriting the tree. This is the part that we, I actually had to rewrite completely, um, thanks to Zephyrin, some sarcastically, some not. Um, so OK, let's see what we can do. This is the name of the function. Uh, it, we declare it as an op. We give it a name, obviously. It has parameters. And what we do is first send all of these parameters to another function called check enter sub args proto. And that does any checks and cleanups that need to be done. And we, re we receive an enter sub again. Three arguments. And now we're, we are holding on to the enter sub. What we want to do is reach the push mark, which is the next op in that tree. And enter sub is a unary op, which means it has an argument, which is the push mark. The push mark creates a list of arguments. So because that is an op that receives an argument, we can call inner op on it. And inner op will give us the next op that it uses. So our push op is actually cast it to a unary op and call op first on it. And that's it. We just reached the push mark. It's fantastic. We're now at the push mark. We're moving forward. We need to get all the way to foo. Now, we've noticed one situation in which we didn't really reach push. Uh, we think that the next one will be GVSV. But what we actually had was there was another op there before. Instead of enter sub going to push mark, enter sub went to a list and then to push mark. So maybe we're not there yet. Now, the push mark sees the GVSV as a sibling. That is the connection between them. Instead of a unary op, this is a sibling op. So what we can say is, hey, if there is no sibling op to this, then we're not there yet. This is the code. If there is no sibling to this thing, well, we're not there yet. So please do this again. We're calling op first again to make sure that we now know for sure we're at the right place. So now we can reach into GVSV, which holds foo, which we need. That's the argument. All we have to do is say, give me the sibling. Here it is. Give me the sibling. So now we got arg. Here it is. And we have it. So now we can use this in a new uh, operation, in a new op. So we're going to do two things that at first I won't explain. But at the end of it, you'll see, which will take about two minutes. How am I doing on time? I think I've how much time do I have? I'm sorry. 28 minutes? Wow. You might be leaving early. So first, we're going to call op more sib set, which changes the sibling of push op to the sibling of arg. Now, what this does is take that line over there that you're seeing between push mark and GVSV and change it to push mark to GV, like this. OK? It's not clear yet why we're doing this, but I think the next line will explain it. We're sending the last sibling of the argument itself to null, basically severing the line. So this connection that you see between GVSV, which is foo, and is array ref, is now severed. And what you can see here is that these two lines allowed us to take foo out and remove it from the rest of the tree. We need foo. We don't need the rest. So we've elegantly removed foo from that entire chain of operations, right? Because we want to use foo. The next thing we can do is basically remove everything. Hey, take the enter sub. We know it connects outside of foo now and release it. And what it's going to do is take this tree, release the enter sub, release the push mark. And because that connection is no longer to, to arg, it will release this and this. And we've just eliminated all of the unnecessary opcodes, which is pretty cool. Then 
We simply created a new op. I wish we could create a new op with all of the arguments uh, right away, but uh, uh, before 522, I think, there was a, a small error with this. So first we created as an empty op, a null op, that doesn't go anywhere, but it leads to arg, so there's a connection to arg. And then we set it to custom and to give the, the address of the op that we wrote. And like I said, the check, um, the check of the enter sub allows you to return a different thing, the call checker. So we're going to return this new custom op that's a unary op to the GVSV foo as the new op that we want to execute instead. So what happened was that we have an access function. When you compiled it, Perl created that tree. We created a check for this, and then it ran the check. The check walked up the tree, took the arg out, removed that entire tree, created an op that goes to that and returned that subtree instead, which is really nice. And this was actually Zephyrin's work. So it is a very, very powerful thing. And we're now playing with how far we can take it. And it could be used for a lot of things where you need really intense, um, intense work, because you can take a lot of things and do them at the same time in a single op. One of the major optimizations that are coming is the multi-dereference op that Dave Mitchell has wrote, which when you use multiple references, like you deref one to the other, to the third, to the fourth, and fifth, it just creates all of these dereferencing operations as one operation, which is really fast. So you can take a lot of stuff and put them in a single op. Um, it's, it's a bit crazy. It's a bit um, dangerous if you don't do it right, but it's very, 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 very powerful. So custom ops, um, they're amazing, but um, despite being introduced to 5.8, which was really long time ago, like Perl has so many of these hidden features, this was in 5.8. Like this was in 5.8, in 5 Larry did Perl 5. Like it was so far, imagine it, right? So we could have used it except that the CV set call checker and the XOP entry that we're using, was a, they were actually only introduced in 2010. And we still want to support older versions. So there's this sentence I saw in a movie. Um, and what we do is actually this small check that basically says, hey, if I have these, I want you to use custom ops. If I don't have them, please don't use custom op. It's fine. It won't recompile, like it won't change the op tree. You'll still get the op tree, but it's in excess. So it's, it's pretty fast. Um, it's faster, at least. And the use custom ops is later checked and said, well, if you have used custom ops, I would like you to change the tree. And if you don't, just keep the function the way it is. So it will just revert to this function, which is fairly simple. And you now understand it. It's like, I want a function that receives a scalar, returns a scalar. I want it to call magic on the scale to support uh, tied variables. And check if it's a reference. If so, the reference, check the type, and return yes or no. It's a simple if, and that's it. So that's not bad. So let's talk about speed. These benchmarks are not up to date. I think the current implementation is faster, but screw it. Um, the excess, which here is the opcodes, full opcodes, they run at three. The PP run at six, which is the um, ref call. And the ref type, which is the correct way to do it, is nine. What you're looking at is actually these numbers, which is the better way of doing benchmark. If you're using benchmark PM, please switch to dumbbench, which does it uh, better and has much fewer false positive. And you don't actually compare one to the other um, in runtime. You just output the numbers and then compare them. And what you can see is that the custom ops are three times as fast as doing ref type. And they're only twice as fast as calling ref, which is not bad at all, I think. Um, it's pretty cool. And take into account that this is not a safe ref type, because a safe ref type, ref type will call both of these. It will call ref and then ref type. So we're comparing like an unsafe ref type, um, maybe without use warnings. I don't know if safe is the word, um, probably not the best word, but one that, does, that this might produce warnings unless you suppress them than a version that does not. So uh, there are a few common practices, yes, already. First, 
oftentimes what we want to check is not whether it's a hash, we want to check whether it's a, a, a hash ref, we want to check whether it's a plain hash ref. The best way to do this is to call ref and also check if it's not blessed. Because oftentimes this is actually the check that we want to do and most of us don't even write this. But in ref util there's is plain hash ref. And is plain hash ref, is plain scalar ref, is plain array ref, and so on and so on. And that allows you to check that it's an unblessed ref. That's pretty cool. Blessed uh, hash references, you can check, or any other reference, you need to call ref, and then you need to check whether it's blessed. And then you need to call ref type. Um, because if it's blessed, ref is not going to tell you what the ref type is. Ref is going to tell you what it is blessed into. So, whoops. So now you have to call these three. But we have is blessed hash ref, and is blessed array ref, and is blessed uh, scalar ref, and so on, which is kind of nice. In the future, hopefully very near future, I was supposed to do it before I got here, and I, I couldn't. Um, we're going to split refutil. Uh, refutil is um, only in excess, and, and the opcode is in it and everything. And we want to actually move it to refutil excess and introduce refutil, which is pure Perl. So when you call refutil, if you want to install it, and you have a compiler, it will automatically install refutil access for you and will load it in, during runtime. But if you're running on a machine that does not have access because you're using some hosting company or whatever, then refutil will have correct pure Perl um, versions of the code. Okay, so it will be a seamless uh, transition if you have uh, the ability to run access code. Of course, I forgot one more thing. We are hiring. This is work that I've done mainly at work because they let us work on different projects and they let us play with the Pearl Core, which is fantastic. So we actually uh, got together and worked on this and we get to do a lot of other cool stuff. Again, if you're interested, come see me. It's sort of the, the last part. I want to end it because it's kind of long, but I have more stuff to say. So I, I owe a lot of thanks to other people. I've written a portion of this, but a lot of other people have written more than this and have explained to me what portion um, I've written and how to write it. So uh, I owe a lot of thanks to a lot of people. Aaron Crane is one of the maintainers at this point, whether he likes it or not. He introduced a lot of cleanups, a lot of corrections. Um, he helped a lot with this. Zephram has basically provided the entire rewritten part of the opcodes. And it was very elegant. And Tony Cook uh, uh, provided the Git Magic part, um, just noticing it. And um, Mithaldu actually took everything that Zephram wrote and created a pull request with this, which is super awesome. Vicente helped me write the original one with Gonzalo, Andreas. Mattia, Rafael, Eve, and Yarko all provided a lot of feedback. And it was very helpful. And P5P is a club where we just down and write some, some core stuff, so it's fun. And I want to thank everyone that, that works with me on it. Um, specifically, Gonzalo and um, Vicente are giving talks here, so you might be interested in going. They're also really interesting and completely odd in a good way. Of course, I want to thank you. You've stayed here for a fairly long time. Um, I didn't see one person die. Three fell asleep. It's, I think it's fine. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much for, for this. I actually have some bonus slides, and it, it depends on whether uh, we could do uh, one of several things. One, I could go into bonus slides. Two, I can pause here, no bonus slides, we'll ask questions. Three, both of them, so I'll go through bonus slides and then we'll have questions. I think we have enough time. And uh, the fourth one, you can just leave. So <laughs> I want to give those options. 60 minutes is a, is a long time. Um, so let's, let's see some hands. Um, I will assume that anyone that doesn't raise a hand just wants to leave and that's fine. Um, who wants to see some bonus slides? Okay, who wants to see bonus slides and have questions at the end? Okay, uh, just, just questions and we'll wrap it up. Who wants to leave? The guy who stood up, okay, fine. <laughs> All right, so let's do some bonus slides. Um, I was bored, I wrote this on a train ride from um, uh, Belgium to Amsterdam. It basically rewrites your code to use uh, refutil. So you call refutil rewriter and then you can say either rewrite a string, here's like a string with ref in it, or rewrite file and it will go through that and it will find all the uses of ref and it will rewrite it into using refutil, which is kind of nice. So some of the stuff that it will do is this. It will replace this, find the array and replace it with this array ref. It will also find it with, um, uh, 
with parameters or not, which is actually different when you use PPI. And if it's at the end, it will understand it, whether it's with parentheses or not. Um, even if it's unless at the end, like a postfix unless. So it will rewrite both of these. Um, if you have ref, it will replace it with isref because it sees that you're not comparing it to something, so you probably want isref. And um, all of these, if you have an if with a, um, a condition like an or or an and, it will replace it, even if it's on different lines, which took code to do. So like these are all things I actually had to program in. That's why I'm excited at these, because like if you look at it, you go, of course it changes it. But no, these are different. So, um, and um, hashes as well, of course. So it's kind of neat. I like it. Um, it uses PPI to do the heavy lifting. So thank you for Mithaldu for maintaining PPI right now. Um, it's a bit tricky to do stuff like that because PPI doesn't see the opcode uh, tree. What it actually sees is a document with a bunch of tokens in it. And it's not very clear on what those, to those tokens are. Like it doesn't know this is a function called ref or this is a function, uh, whatever. It just says, this is a word. <laughs> And the word is ref. I don't know what that means. You, you try to figure it out. So it, it's tricky to do with Perl, but uh, it was enough for me to write this. Um, you can find it on my GitHub. I'm not releasing it because there are a few issues with it. Um, because in many cases, you actually want is plain ref, is plain hash ref, and stuff like that. And we accidentally, like if you just replace them to is hash ref, then you might miss out. So it's not exactly accurate in that sense. Um, so use it your own risk. Play with it. Uh, put it in Git before you rewrite uh, to make sure that you did it right and submit uh, any patches if you want. Um, I might release it at some point. And uh, thank you very much. However you call the conference, enjoy it. OK, good news and gooder news. Um, questions and answers, and then you actually have some extra time to just loiter around. So does anyone have any questions? Any at all, feel free. Yes. Oh, I could, I could rewrite the top of the stack. Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a way to do this, obviously. Um, there was no, so right. I'll repeat the question. The question was, if there's only one argument at the top there, and you're taking it, you're deciding on a different value, and you're returning it to that stack, why are you doing that dance there instead of just changing the top of the stack? Because it's already there. Um, no specific reason, really. Um, it's just the way, um, the, the way in my head it works. You, you take it, you decide on stuff, you return it. It's a fair optimization to make. If you would like to submit a pull request, I know a guy who will merge it. OK? Fair? The slide is 2010. 2010. Not 5.10, 2010. I went on years. I did a check on the history to see when the function was introduced into Git and then took that year. So I. I yeah. When was 5.14? When was 5.14 released? 2011, I believe. Does that, can anyone verify this? I think uh, 514 came out in 2011, which means that the code was added in 510 in a tw in 2010 in a release, right? Which means that I'm talking about years. So the question is, why am I checking 510? I'm not checking that. The check is on the right version of Perl, and I didn't know the, I didn't show the version of Perl that I'm checking. I just explained the year. That's that's my answer. So I we are doing the right check. It, we're not checking as 510. We're checking the right version of Perl that has it. It's not checking even the version of Perl. What am I saying? It's checking the functions. But what I de explained was not the version of Perl. I was talking about the year it was introduced and written. That's all. Any other questions? Yes, the gentleman in the back. Uh, sorry, I came late. I saw you're using the, uh, you're using Enter stuff and you're rewriting the off 
You came at the right time. <laughs> no. 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 Possible is a very hard word to say no to in Perl. I can't do it. You might. I don't know. <laughs> There's, I'm sorry? Yes. Right. Yes. So uh, the, the question was, uh, can I introduce macros with it? Macros, I think, are a particular type of mechanism, and that's why I'm not sure. If it's functions, which is probably an easier thing to, to respond to. OK, you mean functions, then that's an easier thing for me to reply to. Perl has CV uh, set call checker. Is it CV set call checker? I think it's call checker. Oh, OK. So there are, there are pluggable keywords, basically, and there's an ability to um, hook up to the part that is about to call a function and then allow you to parse that part, which is interesting. It's basically saying, hey, Perl, I want to parse that, pit, that bit. Like, I want to introduce a parser inside Perl. You can do really interesting stuff in Perl, like, really. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Uh, I'll start with, with him, and then Todd will move to you. Yes, you may. <clears throat> yes. Are you willing to sit with me and check if we can speed up text CSVXS by this? Yes. Uh, can, yeah. Awesome. I don't have to repeat the question. It's awesome. <laughs> what? Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> uh, Todd. At what, at what uh, uh, phase in the program is the op tree being optimized? It is being uh, optimized um, as part of the compilation. There are, I think, two phases. The first one is when it just compiles, and then part of it is after, after that is the people optimizer. Right, and but it, it, oh, that's loud. Uh, but it's not happening until access loader is being called, right? Uh, so. Excess is loaded before it reaches that part. Because the, the excess is loaded on a use, so it, it happens before it actually reaches that part of the code. So when you call like use ref util, yeah. you've just loaded it. And the is array ref call later, Pro gets to it later. So the excess is loaded first, it reaches that part, and the excess parts already exist. Okay. It hasn't rewritten it yet. It will there, but okay. Yeah. Any other questions or or comments? I don't know. Um, yes, Vikenti, you're gonna have to run like really fast. Um, <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> it's yes. a very quick question. Uh, do you have to rewrite the whole thing again when new, ver new version of Perl comes out? Uh, well, shouldn't be, um, because it's using the API. There's this awesome feature about using um, recognized public API. Instead of using internal APIs, that is not documented and forbidden, because Perl can make sure that it works. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to say this. A lot of authors, uh, well, not a lot, but some authors prefer to use undocumented, uh, non-public, private uh, Perl API functions, and then things can break because it's like you know, private and stuff. Um, but this uses the public APIs, uh, so it shouldn't fail. Um, there are a few pieces in the code that uh, cater to versions of Perl that didn't have some of those calls. Specifically, it uses a file called pp port.h created by a module called develop pp port, which is uh, developed uh, as part of core, and it tries to bring to the future, uh, sorry, bring to the past uh, macros and subroutines that did not exist yet. Um, so if I carry this file, when you try to compile it on an older version of Perl that didn't have those macros and those APIs yet, it will try to provide them on the spot, which is really nice. For the future, it shouldn't have to change. Um, minus any other optimizations that someone else might incur uh, into it without uh, um, 
uh, proper documentation, uh, but we'll see. So the op tree will stay the same? I, I am assuming so, but I can't tell the future. Uh, there might be some optimization that will happen, um, but I don't think it will change. I don't, I don't see how. Any other questions, comments, um, um, requests for you pick? Okay, so you have six and a half minutes to loiter around and harass people outside. Uh, please don't. And that's it. Thank you very much.